Hey, hi, I'm Bill Devlin. I'm down here with Grant Dupil, and we're doing some urban archaeology, exploring Tobacco Town. Uh, most people probably don't know that New Milford used to be called Tobacco Town because of the uh, sun-grown tobacco that was grown here for cigars. Uh, back in the 1920s, the towns around here had a baseball league, and of course, Danbury was the Hatters, Brookfield was the Farmers, Ridgefield was the Millionaires, and New Milford's town team was called the Tobacco Towners. Yeah. We're looking at a warehouse that was built in 1870 by a guy named E.A. Wildman. And uh, this is one of 12 warehouses that was in New Milford at one point along these railroad tracks. And uh, we're gonna see a couple of other examples uh, later on. This used to be called Green's Warehouse. The Green family owned it for many, many years. Um, and a lot of people remember Perry Green, who was the last member of the family to uh, run this place. He used to have a horse up here that's now at the Historical Society called Waramog, who was uh, pretty well known at, uh, for most of the people who were around here in the 50s and 60s. Anyway, the machinery on the deck there, uh, I did work for the uh, owner of this place when it was turned into a hotel back in the 1980s. And uh, we researched it. An architect from uh, Wilton did a great job of restoring it. And uh, it has stood the test of time. Anyway, some of the machinery they wanted to save was the hoist mechanism and a tobacco press. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but that was used for pressing the leaves before they were packed into cases for shipment out, out of here. And the leaves, or the tobacco leaves for the cigars would be sent to manufacturers and then those cigars would be sent all over the United States, Europe, uh, the Netherlands, Germany, uh, a lot of places. So this was an international operation. It was also a big thing for New Milford because um, a lot of people took part in it although not everybody did. Uh, but these warehouses employed about 500 people during the packing season to get all together. The building next to it, Beach Building, was built in the 1890s. And uh, even though it was not built as a tobacco warehouse, because it was basically a commercial building, a hardware store on the first floor, um, the second floor was used for packing tobacco too. So the railroad tracks are the key here. down on Dorwin Hill Road. We're looking at the uh, houses right now that near this field and brook, but at one point this, is, this was prime tobacco land. This was uh, the property of the Halpin family, which uh, was the largest local tobacco dealer in uh, New Milford. So why tobacco in New Milford? Uh, we know about, you know, probably have heard of tobacco grown in the um, Connecticut River Valley, but at one point, New Milford, about a hundred years ago, New Milford grew as much tobacco as any of the towns in the Connecticut River Valley. Big difference was that the tobacco was grown in, under the sun and not under um, netting like it is in, in the Connecticut Valley. It's a fussy crop, it takes a lot of work, takes a lot of thought. They had to start the plants in these pans and transplant them into the land. And then uh, there's all kinds of things they had to worry about. They had to worry a lot about the weather. Hailstorm could wipe out a whole crop. Um, thunderstorms, everybody had people that have to go out into the, into the fields and push the plants back up. Uh, they had to worry about tobacco worms eating the plants. So they had to get them off by hand. They had to cut off the flowers off the plants. It was a lot of, a lot of work, uh, but was it worth it? Yes, it was worth it because uh, tobacco was the most valuable crop per acre outside of greenhouse flowers back about 100 years ago. So uh, many of the bigger houses on along Route 7 or the nicer houses you might see in town on South Main Street or on uh, the Green even were built by people who had a good years, good years tobacco crop or who were dealers in tobacco. And like I said, this was the Halpin Farm um, they actually lived across the road. Halpins uh, ended up having six different barns. This was probably the first one that was built. It's the only one still standing. And Stuart Halpin, who was our, the grandson of the, the man who founded this farm, um, he was our first mayor. So Stuart Halpin has left us, fortunately, 
a really, really nice and detailed account of growing tobacco. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all the details of it, but we'll, we'll see what this barn can tell us. So around about August, when the plants were about three feet tall, uh, they would be harvested and put on wagons. There's an identical door on the other side of the barn. So the wagons would come in here, they would uh, pin the uh, tobacco leaves on the left and hang them from the rafters, which you'll see a shot of later. And uh, this whole entire barn would be filled completely. Even the, sometimes even the center, central aisle where guys had to get up there and try to get these things up, maybe uh, all the way to the top of the, of the barn here. The reason they did that was because the uh, leaves needed to be cured. So they would be dried out. The way they did that was you could see hinges on the side of the barn here. Those could be, uh, those allowed slats to be opened up so you could get air in here. Or uh, if it was raining, if it was a bad rainstorm or thunderstorm, they could protect the leaves by closing those off. One of the things that had to happen was uh, they got rid of the flowers. I've never grown tobacco, but one of the accounts I've seen from Howard Peck, who was our longtime town clerk, he wrote about um, the tobacco fields and planting it, and he said that the, the flowers had a pinkish hue. And so when the barn quilt went up here, the designer that we hired uh, kind of did a little imaginative design based on the tobacco leaf and the, the, the pinkish tobacco flowers. Once the leaves were drying in the barn, the farmers had to wait until October, and October was a good month for a rainy kind of weather where you'd have rain and then maybe a misty day following that. So anybody who's ever um, dried, uh, grown and dried in herbs, like oregano or basil or something like that, you know what happens when the uh, leaves get really dry and brittle, they can crumble. So when they were waiting for this kind of, what they call the tobacco damp, which hopefully could go for a couple of days, a little bit of dampness would be let in and they would kind of reconstitute the leaves a little bit so they wouldn't fall apart. And the next step was to put them onto the wagons again, bring them down to the warehouses downtown where they could be packed and sent off. And these uh, leaves were destined to be the wrapper leaves, different times the wrapper leaves for cigars and sometimes for the binder leaves inside the cigar, uh, depending on the, the time period. This was a unique thing. About 10% of the tobacco in the state was grown here, eight to 10% uh, at its height. But things started to happen in the uh, World War I era. Things like men coming back from World War I, they, they had been given free cigarettes, so they were starting to prefer cigarettes over cigars. Um, there were things like in the Depression, where um, <clears throat> the uh, New Deal, part of the New Deal was paying people not to grow certain crops. So that knocked a couple of years off. And uh, then there were sy synthetic wrappers that were developed that kind of cut into the market. So this barn is one of the, the last that's really uh, completely and almost completely intact. And uh, it kind of really shows you a lot about what happened here. All right, we're down at the former Halpin Tobacco Warehouse. Today it's Gaslight Village condominiums, but back in the day, this was built uh, just before the turn of the century. And it was purchased by a guy named by, uh, J. Stewart Halpin uh, and this is where the leaves from the barn that we were just at would go before they were shipped out. The wagons with full of tobaccos would be unloaded here on the bottom floor and then an elevator would bring them up to the third floor where women would sort and size the leaves and then they would be packed into cases. The cases of the tobacco were uh, often can be like four or five hundred pounds. So any warehouse that you see will have these, um, these kind of shouldered braces around the posts that are supporting it because they needed that extra support to hold those big heavy cases. If you can imagine that each the, these cases might be piled up, there was a lot of weight on that second floor of these, uh, these places, these warehouses. According to Stuart Help, and they wanted to, to sweat the leaves. Of course, heat rises, so those upper floors would be good for uh, you know, a humid temperature. So they wanted to keep them, I guess, from, uh, from drying out too much. So this is the last stop before they were shipped out. 